cloud. Admit Paul Allen. All right. Well, I am uh, I'm just delighted. I, I want to say something about this group of students. It's the first time that we did a, uh, uh, a program with high school students where we met with the parents and the students before making our selections. And this is a, a highly motivated group of students who are rising juniors or seniors in what we call a uh, this time around a fellowship as opposed to an internship because uh, I think the, the term fellowship is reserved for um, exceptional students wherever it is when you see a fellowship applied and and we were hesitant to use the term internship because it's it's virtual it it, it includes a lot of training and not so much on the job presence you know which is what an inter the word internship uh, suggests. Uh, on-site job shadowing so because we we're doing a lot of we did sort of we've done certifications we've had a lot of presentations by by a, a range of employees from uh, the company uh so in this kind of new if you want to, a, a worn out term the new normal which is virtual meetings and knowing that a great many uh professionals in the company are, still haven't resumed working in person in offices, um, we, we thought it would be uh, effective to work with students from across the service territory, which we're doing, and to do this virtually. And we had exactly one in-person field trip experience, which was really rewarding because the last time we did a, a virtual internship with more than six people was uh, concluded in, in February. Uh, and that was a eight week program with 15 students. So we bumped that up to 20 students this time. And we were a little more uh, selective to make sure that we had students who wanted to stay connected with our company. And that's the, that's the key difference here. And I think we're gonna be doing this moving forward rather than offer a, kind of a one-time experience to students who are interested. We wanna work with students who wanna stay connected with this company. And it's, it's exciting to have Tom Manriquez in the mix in university programs. We had a presentation yesterday from Justin Real and Power Pathway program. And so what we're doing for kind of the first time ever to this degree is knitting together high school programs with post-secondary programs, Power Pathway and university programs, because that's really the, that's what a pathway is about. It, you know, it can begin as early as kindergarten or middle school, and it carries all the way through high school into college and beyond. So it's exciting to have this group here. I'm really proud of these students. I'm proud of their parents and their teachers and the work that they've been doing. Um, they are, they've been working on, and props to pg e for always providing a model. The capstone project this year around, uh, this, this time around, is based on a, a, an actual grant opportunity that pg e had last year relating to creation of um, resiliency hubs that would serve communities and populations that are at specific risk of climate related um, threats, if you will. And so our five teams have each uh, selected a, a different community and a different specific threat and proposed a solution within a, uh, using a, uh, for a pilot project using a, working within a $100,000 budget. There are five teams of four students each. They are um, provided uh, up to five minutes to present, plus a 30 to 60 second public service announcement clip that they've created for their project. And we have, uh, uh, there'll, there'll be you know, time for questions and answers after that. We figure five minutes for presentation, maybe three or four minutes for questions and answers after each presentation. And we are delighted to have our three judges here today. Um, and I'll introduce them, but I'd love to hear a little something about, about each, each of you. Uh, beginning with, um, I think, the, a new, new, new friend to me, Gina de Guzman. You are, thank you for joining us. And can you tell us what your role is in the company and I know one of them is you're 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 president of one of our ERGs right 
Correct, correct. So long time um, member of this uh, Filipino, which we, we, we later renamed to Samahan, which means unity, um, ERG. And I'm also a, a board member of the um, Employee Community Fund. Um, mm. So that's the fun side of, uh, of work. And then uh, my regular job, I'm a manager in the IT organization, um, business technology, um, managing two teams. That's, that's great. Uh, thank you. Uh, we, we, uh, maybe, uh, maybe we can hear, get a presentation out of you for the next time we bring uh, interns together. It sounds like an interesting, both, both of the things that you do, the, uh, sure, sure. The, the employee community fund or the, or, and the Samhan, anything about ERGs is of interest. And then of course the IT sector is just an expanding one, isn't it? No problem. And I'm, I'm really excited about this. I've all, I've been part of our scholarship committee for many years also. So um, this is, this is really exciting for me. Oh, great. Great. Glad to hear it. And um, uh, 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 Alicia, tell us about you. Alicia Burt. Well, I, hello again, everyone. Um, I'm Alicia Burt from Community Relations. And um, you, you probably have heard from me a couple of times at the start of the program. And um, I handle the education workforce development portfolio, but I am also on the ECV scholarship board with Gina. And um, so I think some of you may be um, knocking on our door for a scholarship in the near future. And we look forward to um, looking at in, entertaining your applications and encouraging you to apply. So keep it in mind. Oh, we just lost somebody. I'm letting her back in. Hang on. There she is. And then last but by no means least, uh, is Chris Benjamin and geez, Chris, I'm trying to remember the name of the the Elizabeth Gardner Museum or something like that. Where we <laughs> first, do you remember first work? Yeah, I, I do. Uh, um, um, and you've uh, we were I was there with the solar uh, I think demonstration, and you were there with something I'm sure related to sustainability and renewable energy. Uh, and now you're the director. Are you the director of sustainable of corporate sustainability? That is true. I love that title. And did you have a, a hand in in some of these grants that are the sustainability grants that the PG&E uh, has offered? Yeah, it's really funny. Um, so just hello, everybody. It's really nice to meet you. And um, uh, this is a great program. And just making it to this stage is huge. Uh, you all are demonstrating just a lot of leadership. And I remember back when I was your age, when I take the time to kind of do this kind of stuff with everything going on, it's hard, right? You've got a lot going on in your life. And um, so showing the interest and taking the, uh, the initiative is really, really impressive. And you should all just be proud, proud of that and proud that you get to work with somebody like Barry, who I've, I've known for a long time. And a lot of the work that uh, I lead at PG&E in one way or another has to deal with addressing climate change. And PG&E just recently announced a whole set of longer term climate goals that are industry leading. Uh, if you go to pge.com slash climate, you can check it all out along with a really cool video from our CEO, Patty Poppy. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that's what I've been working on. Uh, but I also um, have for many years uh, supported PG&E's uh, efforts to adapt to climate change and uh, uh, actively involved in the program that you guys are, are talking about today, the Resilience Hubs uh, grant program. So my team uh, manages that actually, along with uh, members of Alicia's team. So excited to hear um, and support all of you and appreciate the opportunity. Great, thank, thank you, Chris. Um, and in, indeed, uh, this is an impressive group of students. And the, the last thing I wanna add uh, before we open it up for the presentations is that it's our intention that every student in this in this cohort is offered every opportunity to stay in touch with us um, to, uh, to learn more about our scholarships, our university programs, even the temporary jobs that are available through the hiring hall and that endless list of possibilities uh, and, and in, including uh, additional field trips. And we've had uh, 
this the su the success of this effort really depends upon the volunteers that we have, and uh, I we we can't thank all the mentors enough. Each student had a personal one to one mentor for guidance. Several project mentors have been involved, and the fact that we're able to um, do that kind of matchmaking and give give employees a chance to mix with the the next generation of of, of scientists and, and and community you know i mean customer service whatever the roles are that they have the it's just really rewarding and i'm so grateful to all of the mentors all of the employees but it's our hopes that we'll see uh some or all of these students again many times over the next uh, several years so that's uh this is uh this this isn't the end of this this is a this is the the end of the beginning maybe and uh and the beginning of of more goodness to come. So with that, I'm going to go, you know, I don't think that the interns will be surprised if we just start with team one. And um, I will introduce uh, them uh, by name. Sydney Abbott is in, comes from Folsom. Isaiah Brown Jones is in Oakland. And Marianne Eichmann is also in Oakland. And uh, Paisa Mandahar is uh, at, at uh, Irvington High School in Fremont. So it's the floor is yours and take it away. Okay, so I'll start by sharing our video. Can you all see my screen? <laughs> all right. Our plan is to build a Wi-Fi of resiliency hub in New County, California. New County, California is still recovering from the devastating fire 2018. Our goal is to partner with California State University, Chico, to provide the community with classes on the effects of climate change and wildfire safety, as well as create a daycare center for students from kindergarten to 12th grade. Our resiliency hub will also be a donation center to help families in need who are still affected by the 2018 wildfire. All right, so that was our video. And now on to our presentation. So as stated in our video, um, we are going to build a resiliency hub to help with the effects of the 2018 wildfire in Butte County. So what is the problem? So what we are trying to focus on is the effects of climate change, specifically with wildfires. Due to climate change, California has been in a drought for a very long time, and that has dramatically increased the risk of wildfires. One of the reasons that wildfires are so bad is besides the fact that they destroy communities is they um, have terrible health impacts on the community in which the fire happens and can also disrupt ecosystems. For our resiliency hub, we're going to focus on the residents of Butte County. So here is an image of the fire risks of Butte County. So our program. So our resiliency hub is going to be partnered and located at California State University, Chico in, uh, for Butte County. And what we want to have there is we want to educate the community on wildfire safety and climate change, as well as we wanna give the community ideas of sustainable rebuilding such as solar panels and emphasize uh, the importance of removable flammable vegetation since after the 2018 wildfire many of the species that have been flourishing have been non-native and invasive species and also been very flammable our resiliency hub will also have a child care center from for children from kindergarten to 12th grade run by the education program at Chico, and we will also have a donation center to help students in need. As for the community, you are college students to serve as mentors to any mid schoolers or high schoolers in the community and expose the college students to real life work experience so they can have the tools ready for the middle schoolers or high schoolers and have college students provide at a better perspective on solutions to the community issues, such as littering, um, yard work, or vandalism, and involve residents in the rebuilding of their properties. And that alone will have the feeling of the community to grow stronger 
and social skills and self-esteem and and uh, individuals will benefit them. Okay, so one of our group members, Sydney Abbott, wasn't able to be with us today, but we do have a recording of her presenting her slides. Um, I think it might be a bit quiet, so if you'd like, you can increase the volume on your own device. So this slide is about the budget and the sustainability of our project. So in our budget, we plan to spend 40% in emergency supplies, which will include water, food, blankets, and more. 30% of the budget will go to the wages of our volunteers. And the other 30% will go to educational supplies used to teach um, the Butte County residents, in which a portion of it will go to teaching residents how to have controlled fires of their own to burn dried vegetation. For the sustainability of this project, um, this project has the ability to sustain itself as there will be volunteers of residents and college students. New sets of volunteers each year because students graduate, but then there will be new students attending Chico State. Previous volunteers can help educate new volunteers of the logistics and challenges of the residency hub. And as we will talk about in the next slide, other colleges can get involved by incorporating a residency hub in their community. So this slide is about our partners and expansion opportunities. So our starting partnership would be with the California State University of Chico. And as mentioned in previous slides, we will provide education and assistance for residents in regards to climate change, wildfires, and more. Students and staff that are involved with the sustainability sector of Chico State will volunteer to lead our classes and events. And this project has the potential to expand across California with the integration of residency hubs and other CSUs BCs and other colleges that would like to participate. And this will also sustain our project across the board. Okay, so moving on to the measurables, this is essentially just how we're gonna measure the success of this project. There can be many ways that you can gauge the success of a project, but we're gonna focus mainly on these two. The first one is seeing how many people and volunteers are actually involved with and use the hub. And this is important because it allows us to know whether our resiliency hub is, actual help, is actually helping the community or not. Um, another thing that we're gonna do is send out surveys to the community just to see what their feelings are on the hub. This is good because it allows us to see what the public opinion of the resiliency hub is and it could possibly lead to the community suggesting, suggesting some things on what they think could be improved. Lastly, just a few people to thank. Um, Natasha Wiener, she is my personal mentor. She, um, her job for PG&E is to physically go up to Paradise and Butte County to help rebuild the communities there. And it was really helpful to be able to talk to her for advice um, on what we could improve upon on our project. Um, Mike Cordova, he's Sydney's mentor. He came into our group Zoom meetings and provided information on Butte County, such as demographics. And he also provided more information on other organizations that do similar environmental action. Um, there's also Paul Allen. He also came into our group Zoom meetings and he helped a lot with like brainstorming and just dumping out ideas. And he gave us a lot to think about. And of course we can't forget about Barry. Barry has helped us so much throughout this whole project and throughout the whole fellowship. So big thank you to Barry. And thank you to the judges here today for coming here and taking the time to evaluate our project. Bravo. I would uh, I would love to provide a couple of minutes to judges for questions they may have of this. Uh, this is a great project. Um, I'm staying neutral. The judges are in charge of uh, questions and answers. Anything from uh, Alicia, Gina, or Chris? Um, great presentation. Thank you. I did have a question for the team. Um, I really am interested about your linkage with students. Um, number one, it, providing daycare um, for those in need. How, how do you envision that working and who would be some of your community partners? 
So when I talked with my personal mentor who physically goes up to Butte County and helps them rebuild, she mentioned that childcare was actually a really big need for the community there after the fire because the parents would still need to go out and work, but there was nowhere for their children to stay while they were going working. So we decided to incorporate that into our uh, hub. So we were thinking that like early education majors or some like students that are interested in working with younger people or just interested in taking care of children, I guess in general, they could come over and volunteer and help. And um, part of our budget actually is to provide a small wage for these volunteers. So obviously it would help them because they're college students and it would just be nice to be able to have like a community involvement helping with that child care. Uh, um, great, great, presentation. great presentation guys. So um, quick question, why um, you, you talked about the mentors and you, you identified high school students as being um, the mentors and then I, I see how you progress to, you know, once they graduate, um, you know, coming back just to, to kind of help support the, the new batch of um, um, volunteers, I guess you can say. Why, why did you choose uh, high school students versus um, other ages or age groups? Um, I think for, for our Resiliency Hub, we were thinking mainly of like college students and high school students kind of helping these younger generations because I know it's kind of nice to have like little kids look up to you kind of and being able to like help them with any problem that you can help them with. Um, I forgot the second part of your question. Sorry, could you repeat it? Curious why that age group, um, why not include middle school students, um, you know? Um, well, to be completely honest, we weren't exactly like making it, oh, this has to be like an actual official program where, oh, these high school students will sign up, they'll get assigned with someone. It was kind of just something we were thinking about in like the community aspect, just having like all of the younger generations being able to depend on each other and learn from each other like that. Yeah. Uh, second question. Uh, sorry. <laughs> second question. Surveys, how, how are you guys uh, thinking of um, doing the surveys? Uh, we were either thinking of like going out and handing surveys like physically to people going to their doors and whatnot and getting to collect them later or having some sort of like email that we could send out to residents of a specific community and then getting like a Google form sent out or something like that. Yeah, I think we'd focus mainly on just like emailing out to the community and having kind of digital surveys. Cool. Yeah. Chris? Uh, yeah, I was just going to ask. I, I love this. I, I think it's really compelling and really well thought out. Um, and and I, I love the idea of taking advantage of the university with the students there to get involved. And uh, I, it strikes me that that's going to be a key part of this success is is like the recruiting of students so they understand what this hub is and why they should get involved uh and so i i guess what sorts of things how would you approach that you know how would you approach working with the university to and, and what would be your pitch to the students at the university to get involved and spend time as mentors at the uh at the center um, I think for us, our kind of main pitch and, you know, reasons why we should, like the college students should come and help and volunteer is not only do they get a wage, but we were hoping that um, just giving like the students um, like hands on experience and just kind of having that kind of volunteer and community building skills will kind of add to their repertoire and like their skill set. And we're hoping that that would be kind of major lore, especially also a little bit with Having, like giving them a wage. And since it would be on campus, it would be um, a program that's close and easy, like easy to access for students. I, I love that. I think that's, there's, there's sort of an a built in incentive, you know, for their own kind of career development. And then if we can ask maybe one question, more question on the surveys, because I also picked up on that, which is, uh, I think a really important part of this is sort of somehow measuring success. Um, you know, as you think about surveys, you know, there's the how you do it, you know, do you do it in person, do you do it electronically, did you guys think at all about 
like how frequently, you know, you'd be surveying people to kind of establish some kind of a baseline and then show an improvement or changes over, over time? Um, we were thinking on sort of like a monthly or like three week basis, but because it's on like a campus and there will be workers like parents or whoever else uses the, resi the resiliency hub can just like come in and give their opinions to the workers there just so we can like gauge the public opinion and see what else needs to be done to help the community. That's great. Yeah, taking advantage of the people that are showing up and just asking them directly. Yeah. Cool. Well done. Very well done. Thank you, uh, group one. And we have and we have four more groups to go. Um, so let's take it. Uh, and just a reminder for our judges, you should all have received a, a scoring rubric that you can hopefully have printed out and have. Uh, let me know if you haven't received that so I can get it to you. Uh, but at the end of our all five presentations, you'll be asked. I'll put I, my plan uh, to put you in a breakout room where you'll discuss uh, uh, scores and come to a conclusion and come back to us with the, the top two scoring teams. Uh, everybody receives uh, recognition and a, and a reward in the top team and the second place scoring team will, will get a little extra something. So let's bring it to team two, please. And our second team is got Seth from Templeton, Philip from Oakland, um, Malachi may be missing today from American Canyon, and um, I have, uh, and we have uh, Nishitha. Take it away, Team Two. We've decided to do our resiliency hub project on the heat waves in Bakersfield. So just to introduce this, heat waves are caused by high atmospheric pressures booming, moving warm air to the ground, which affects low income neighborhoods who have less access to air conditioning. And according to the Cal heat assessment tool, there is an average rate of 3.4 annual health events that occur because of heat waves. And how climate change relates to this is that they make heat waves longer, more extreme, and increase the frequency of them. This problem matters because it affects the vulnerable and low-income people of Bakersfield, such as children and elderly, and they can trigger health risks such as asthma, bronchitis, heart failure, and they can trigger mental health deterioration with symptoms such as anxiety and depression. In addition to this, there is also the risk of passing out due to a heat stroke, which can cause injuries as you fall. We've surveyed the low and high income neighborhoods within Bakersfield, and we figured out that the lower income neighborhoods exhibit a higher rate of poverty asthma. And there is a statistic called heat vulnerability that shows the overall harm that can happen during a heat wave. So our solution to this problem is obviously a resiliency hub since that is the point of this project, but we chose to do it in the way of making a cooling center. And we do this by finding a pre-existing <clears throat> pre structure that has cooling, like a library, a school, or a store. And we would concentrate these in low income areas and we would um, set up the space. For example, um, we're gonna work with Beale Library So we're going to work with Beale Library, and um, we're going to rent rooms to use as our area. And so that's going to be our first thing. And then we're going to create a nonprofit organization. And the point of doing that is to rent the rooms at a lower cost or even sometimes free. Um, you can't do that without being a nonprofit. And being a nonprofit just makes it more convenient for us. And we're going to create a website for donations. 
And then we plan on recruiting volunteers and our target audience for the recruiting is going to be high school students who are looking for volunteer hours. And then um, next we're going to open a social media account to inform people of ways to stay safe during the heat. And um, then we plan on expanding to other areas. So for our budget, we um, split up our budget into these bullet points. So first we mentioned we were gonna create a nonprofit organization. And according to the research that we did, uh, it would be about uh, 45 to $50. We would also be printing out certificate for certificates for volunteers. Um, and in the library, we decided to add a water dispenser as well as uh, first aid kits for the general public to use while they're in the library during the heat wave. Um, and for Beale Library specifically, these are the rates for the rooms. So as long as we're in Beale, we would be using about $4,480 for the summer heat waves. And this would be expanding. This would be, um, the cost would be going up as we expand to other cities. Um, so to measure our success, uh, we would be looking at the numbers for people hospitalized due to heat strokes, asthma attacks, and injuries in this area. Uh, the community would be properly prepared for the heat because of our project. And it was mentioned earlier that this project has been done before. It was done in a different county in um, Bakersfield, and it was, we changed it up a little bit and ours is a bit different, but it was a similar concept and it was successful. So our project can be successful as well. And through donations, we would um, be getting donations for other areas if we expand and also informing more people about the heat wave, heat wave and heat wave safety through social media so people in the community can stay in touch. Um, this is our PSA video. Heat waves pose a threat to the residents of Bakersfield. Caused by high pressures in the atmosphere pushing hot air to the ground, they threaten low-income neighborhoods with little access to air conditioning. According to the California Heat Assessment Tool, an average rate of 3.4 annual heat-related health events occur in Bakersfield. These include asthma attacks, bronchitis, heart failure, mental health deterioration, anxiety, and depression. Although there have been people with the same ideas as us who have already set up cooling centers, we want to direct people in these low-income neighborhoods to public cooling centers to reduce the amount of heat-related illnesses. We invite you to volunteer at the Beale Memorial Library to help these people get the cooling that they need. With us, you will guide them to the cooling area and offer water for everyone to be hydrated. Our goal is for there to be fewer hospitalized people because of the heat waves. If our project is successful, we will reach out to other areas who need cooling and inform more people about heat wave safety. Heat waves pose a- um, And to give a little shout out to the people who helped us, we wanted to thank Claudia Adams and Alicia Alibrando. They were our mentors and they helped us um, answer a lot of questions that we had throughout uh, the making of this project. And also, of course, we want to thank Barry for answering our questions and offering us like guidance and support. Thank you for listening. Well done. Nice. Yeah, the, uh, I, I, uh... I'm, I'm glad you used, you know, the California heat assessment tool came from the Resiliency Hub uh, application page. Uh, there are a lot of resources that were available, the pg &E website, so thank you. So let's have some questions from judges, please, for team two. I can kick us off this time. Um, that, really great. I, I love how you know, focused you guys are on the problem and the community and use the maps to really hone in on a real challenge, you know, that we face and continue to face with climate change. Um, and I also, uh, I love the idea of using a library mm -hmm. as a place to go, which is different than, you know, a community center or a high school gym or something like that. And I guess uh, one thought 
I, I don't know if you talked about this, but other ways that you could take advantage of the fact that people are in a library, you know, you could have kids, you know, volunteers reading, you know, kids stories to them in one section or have other people, you have books, you know, and, and, and just the resources that are available in a library. I know our local library has computers uh, where, that you can use. So I guess, did you think at all, or have you thought at all about the way that you could take advantage of, of just having the library as the hub and, um, and just even enhance the experience when people are trying to get out of the heat? Yeah, actually, um, I kind of, I meant to say that when I was talking about the resiliency hubs and the volunteering, but yeah, no, um, we have plans for like the high school students for, you know, kids in the elementary age to tutor kids or, you know, for kids in the younger, you know, kindergarten or, you know, first, second, third grade to have people read books to them and, you know, cause kids get bored. And if you have fun activities like that and learning opportunities like that, then it makes it a more enjoyable stay for them. Awesome. I, I, I love that. And as someone who reads these grant applications, <laughs> that's the kind of stuff, those little creative kind of sparks, you know, that sort of differentiate one from another. It's like, wow, okay, that's, that's, a, that's a neat little thing that why they chose the library. So I think that's, uh, that's great. Okay, I have a question. So um, Bravo, by the way, that was really an eye opener for me. So I, I enjoyed your presentation very much. So what about accessible, um, how would you offer this? So these are, you know, the library is a great option. The, all the options that you guys came up with were really good. What about folks with the, um, accessibility issues? How would you handle that situation where they can't get to the hub? Mm. Um, so the community that community that we chose was a particularly small community it was I can't remember how big it is it was it wasn't very big at all it wasn't nearly as big as like um where we live but uh everything is all pretty close together and even if it isn't um there are a lot of people like not volunteers but the people who would be um at the libraries running the entire like event that would probably uh, be willing to maybe drive them there because it's not a very far drive at all because everything is pretty tight knit. That's a great answer. The other thing that I, I you know, as you guys were talking about how you can um, do kind of the outreach, right? Using social media, you know, creating your website and, and all that stuff. Are there things in place right now from from the city, the county, that you can just piggyback off of? Um, or were you planning to just start something new? I'm curious. Um, well, like we mentioned, this uh, project has already been done before. So uh, we'd be following uh, the, the like path that they already led, but in a different area. So um, I'm not sure if that answers your question. No, it somewhat does. I'm just saying, you know, you guys don't have to do this on your own. Leverage, you know, you, you, have, you have the city there that, that might have something already in place, you know, for communicating, alerting people of, you know, a heat wave, wave situation that's coming up. So it's just, just something to think about. Otherwise, good job, guys. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just add on to that. A great job, very well thought out. And um, one comment I would add is to Gina's point is that we don't, um, there are a lot of resources and um, protecting our most vulnerable communities is paramount. So um, linking with the city, with hospitals, with others that provide medical resources um, might be an idea that we would like to consider to fold into this concept. So great presentation, great idea, and um, and it's never bad to improve upon something that works. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Group three, group three includes Bryce Harrington, um, who attends, you, your school is in San Jose. Mohammed is uh, in El Sobrante, Elias is in Oakland, and Trujita is in Fremont at Irvington High School. 
Europe. Fire Resource and Relief Center for Impoverished Households in Napa County by Bryce Harrington, Elias Corson, Mohammed Hussain, and Tarita Pondam. How do wildfires affect communities? Wildfires cause the loss of life, property, and resources. Also, the threat of wildfires affects communities. <clears throat> wildfires also increase the chance of disease and health disorders among people, and also wildfires uh, release a large amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere attributing to climate change? Wildfires and resource equity in Napa. Napa has had a long history of wildfires and some of the worst wildfires in California's history have been near or in Napa. The recent glass fire in 2020, back in the time when there was the sky was all foggy or smoky and the, the sky turned to orange, I'm sure everybody remembers that. A big part of that was because of the glass fire. It was one of the biggest fires in California history uh, and it burned nearly 70,000 acres and destroyed over 1,500 buildings. 23,000 Napa citizens are currently, as in today, right now, homeless or displaced due to wildfires. Even though there hasn't been a major wildfire in Napa in many years, well, like one, but even still, a lot of people are still displaced due to that. They don't have options because they don't have fire insurance. These people that are displaced are low-income families and people who live in poverty, and that brings me over to resource equity. 52% of renting households in Napa are considered overburdened. As you see in the bottom right, that's a picture of uh, Napa, and a definition of overburdened is that an overburdened household is a household where 30% of the average income is spent on housing costs. So that means rent, electricity, water, that means they don't have that much money to spend on things like fire insurance. And that's why over 70% of overburdened households don't have fire insurance. So when fires like the glass fire happen, there's very little these people can do. They're just stranded without any resources and very, very little way to get back on their feet. As you can see on the left, Napa is Napa and Napa Valley is surrounded by tier three fire zones, which are classified as extreme risk. We use the CPCU uh, CPUC high fire threat district map to find this and it helped in our research a lot. Right, next. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, our resiliency hub. Our resiliency hub would be based in Sonoma Community Center. We assume we could work with the county to use this building in an emergency situation as a base of operations to provide our resources and do the services we hope to provide. Uh, some examples of similar things at my, in Oakland, uh, at the community center that's near my house, during emergency situations, they outsource all types of resources. People can bring in stuff, donate. Uh, and I know there are a bunch of different groups that try to help people that use that community center as a base of operations. So we're thinking we could institute a pretty similar thing in Napa. Uh, as you can see in the bottom left, that's what the community center looks like. Uh, it's located at two, 276 East Napa Street. Uh, and this location had, was pretty specific. We had to choose a specific location because we wanted to be the right distance away from our target group that we could easily serve them. They could get to the place quickly uh, and be able to get the support they need. But we didn't want to risk losing all our resources because if we had a community center in Napa and then Napa burned down and we needed to help people, our community center would burn with it. And then we wouldn't be able to help all the people in need. Uh, and part of that would be part of the outreach we would do to the community would include giving people directions on how to get to the community center, because like I said, it wouldn't be directly in Napa. Uh, that way it wouldn't, we wouldn't lose the resources and they would still be able to access it. Um, so we would tell them how to easily get to our center. And we would also hopefully be able to have shuttles uh, and different types of buses to take people from a few certain drop-off points to the center where they can get the support and shelter they need. And we would give instructions on how to get to those places as well. So the benefits that this would provide to the community would be having or would be having a source of non-perishable food and water along with warm clothing and blankets since if your house gets burned down or in, if you're in an area that you need to evacuate you usually don't have the option to carry a grocery store or your entire wardrobe with you so this is a way for us to provide to those families who definitely are going to need these things along with that the community center that we're thinking of could also work as temporary housing for these displaced families. So they have a place to sleep and a place to a place that they can come back to 
while they're still worrying about this whole wildfire. And we're also gonna be providing transportation for these people, hopefully teaming up with the public transportation systems in the area. This is gonna allow them to have a safe and a pretty effective way of getting to the places they need to go to and having a, having a way to get there easily. Along with that, we plan to be outreaching to the communities by sending out some flyers and postcards to these little income area neighborhoods. So they have a way of knowing uh, where to go or at least what to look out for, for this project. Also, we would be teaming with the local high schools in the area so they could be volunteering there and would be helping, helping our project as well. So their service hours would be working for us. We would be hosting informational seminars in, also in local community centers. This way, this would allow more residents to be aware of what to look out for and how to prevent fires from occurring in the first place. Also, we're going to be creating a website where we're going to have resources for donations and stuff like that available, along with places to meet up for these seminars and other ways to get in touch. Um, so moving on to our budget, so we all have the budget that we have of 100k. Uh, it's going to be spread across buying uh, the buying resources, the community outreach, as well as just miscellaneous costs. But a majority of it is going to be for resources that we'll provide for those that uh, suffered a wildfire or other fire incident. So we'll be spending it on non-perishable foods, clean water, blankets, clothing and tents, basically the uh, realistic needs that everyone has to have. And then secondly, for community outreach, just like uh, Bryce talked about, we want to have a designed and printed um, postcards that we send out to get volunteers and other people interested in knowing about the uh, what we're doing. Uh, we also want to make sure to create a website and we also want to hopefully have like student led food drives or fundraisers. We really want to pull in the local schools as well, since it's an issue that affects all of them and it also brings awareness. Um, then for like just other small costs, we have gas for our vehicles as well as materials for like the building uh, and any medical supplies since, you know, fires can result in different types of burns as well as other things that they're dealing with uh, after the fire. Um, next slide, please. So um, this all feeds into sustainability. So the 100K budget, it is a quite a bit of money, but it would run out technically if we didn't do anything else. So we want to have this uh, continuing without uh, being fully sustainable. So by using community outreach, we'll, been, we'll build a lot of support from the community. And um, also by creating a social media pres uh, presence, we can get people to donate as well as spread the words, which gets farther. And again, more donations mean that we can fund for more items and products to give to the um, people who are suffering. And then um, we also want to bring in uh, volunteer programs in local high schools, just like I said, so that we can have people who continuously work. And it's not just like workers that we hire, since that will drain a lot of the money. So the primary goal of this is to basically make it fully sustainable after the 100K budget, since then it can continue on without like too much additional support from any of the other like sides. So, um, yeah. on the community. Success. We will know that our resiliency hub was successful by expanding to other places that are threatened by wildfire. We would also know that if the community can continue the resiliency hub without our money and without our support constantly, and we'd also, the main important reason for our resiliency hub would to be helping people who suffer from wildfires and don't have enough money to provide for, for themselves. And that would be the most important thing. If our program, like Muhammad was saying, proved to be successful, we were providing resources to all the people in need, and it was working out really well, and in the communities we instituted it in, it was able to keep going for the use of community impact and stuff like that, uh, we would expand to other counties across California. We would look for similar places to Napa that have a lot of low-income citizens and a very high fire risk. And as you can see on the left, here, this is a map of fire danger throughout counties in California from uh, a very similar uh, style. It has the extreme tier three to elevated tier two and then the low risk tier one. Uh, and then the map on the right shows poverty levels throughout counties in California. And what we would do is cross-reference these two maps to find the locations that are in the greatest need of our support. So places that have the highest fire risk and the lowest uh, amount of income. And in doing so, we should be able to efficiently expand and help the people who need the most help. 
Thanks so much to everybody in this program that helped us. While working on the project, we learned a lot about our subject uh, and we learned a lot about how to do group work efficiently. Uh, we definitely couldn't have done that without the help and support of our mentors, uh, especially Barry for setting everything up. You definitely gave us a lot of very, very helpful guidance on our own project uh, and just was kind of the guiding force for the, for the whole program. Uh, Tom, I don't know if he's still in here, but uh, he helped us by giving us the heat map to use and just a lot of good feedback. And then my own uh, personal mentor, Devinder, he helped uh, a lot in just, he helped me through like doing group work. I definitely couldn't have communicated with some of my teammates uh, in the best way I did without his help. And he just gave some good guidance on how we could progress with our project. Mentors rock. Yeah. Let's, let's see your better. And here is our uh, animated video. It's pretty short. It's less of a public service announcement and more of a an awareness video on what the effects and problems with wildfires are and why they're bad. That was it. Yeah, that's our presentation. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask. Well done. To the judges. You know, maybe one, one question for you guys. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I thought it was great how, how you um, very thoughtful about where you cited the community center and that it was near the people that you're trying to reach. So very smart, kind of gets at uh, one of the questions I was asked earlier about accessibility, you know, so the, the more, you know, uh, closely and easily uh, accessible the, the facility is, then it's just making it easier for people to, to get there who you're trying to reach. So I thought that was um, very thoughtful of you guys. Uh, yeah, one of the, and, and I also, I liked how you referenced the Oakland uh, center. I, I don't know if that's the same one that PG&E uh, gave a grant to a couple of years ago to help get set up. But um, you know, one of the things that um, always struck me about uh, when we look at these applications for resilience centers is with something like a wildfire or even an extreme heat event, that's an emergency situation. And so you want to have a safe place for people to go in the emergency. But these same places, whether it's a library or this community center that you mentioned, you know, they're open 24 seven, right? Or, or, you know, 365 days a year. So uh, one thing to think about is how you can use them year round for as a resource for the community that you're trying to reach. And whether that's um, educational sessions or lunch and learns or whatever it is so that they're, um, they're learning about these issues and, and so that when disaster strikes, you know, they already know where to go and they know it's a resource. And I'm just wondering if you thought at all about how to use the center uh, in kind of the non-emergency time, or were you just thinking, you know, it would be used, uh, you know, if, if disaster strikes? Uh, yeah, actually we did exactly. Bryce in his, uh, in his slides, he, when in depth, we would be using the, Bryce, you can go back to that and go more in depth. Uh, it's not right, really yeah. my part, but yeah, we would use those community centers for stuff like educational seminars, but Bryce, take it away. You yeah. know more about this than I do. Yeah. So our original or I, our current idea for this was to hire some people from Cal Fire for, or some expert when it comes to fire safety and stuff like that to teach volunteers and then have those volunteers teach other people who would come in for these seminars. These would probably happen maybe once a month, uh, once every two weeks, just as something for people to have or keep in touch to make sure everything's up to date and to make sure everything's fine. And yeah. yeah. And we do a mix sure. of preventative center seminars that tell people do this or don't do this to make sure fires don't happen. And seminars that are like, if a fire does happen, what should you do? How to pack a go bag, stuff like that. We took inspiration from an earlier project. Uh, to make that part of it. Uh, that's great. I'm sorry I missed that. Yeah, my only suggestion there 
would be to really, you know, kind of partner with the community center itself because they, they probably mm -hmm. have, uh, you know, barbecues or God knows what. Um, and, and you could kind of work into what they're doing too. Uh, kind of if some, so I, I love that. Okay, uh, you, you actually asked the question that I was going to ask or the, the suggestions um, in, in leveraging the current community, you know, centers that are there. Um, well done. This is really concise, very, very um, well presented. Good job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Chris stole our thunder. Um, I had exactly the same questions, but I am really happy to hear about your um, use of experts in this field, such as CAL FIRE, and I would also recommend the local fire departments. Um, and that it's a, it's a year round effort and opportunity to provide education about how to pre prepare a go bag, how to create defensible space around um, a home. And um, while looking out for our, um, all of our communities. And I have to applaud you with the great use of the data, which is publicly available in terms of these heat maps and the overlay with the income um, the populations that are, are most affected are low income communities. So great job. Love the use of data and love the use of experts. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well done, Bryce, if you'll turn off your screen, we'll bring it to our uh, fourth team, which includes Javier and Dylan at uh, high schools in Oakland, Luis at Irvington in uh, Fremont, and Jacob uh, down in San Luis Obispo County at Templeton High School. Real quick, um, Stacy, can we just take a, a quick stretch break? Um, yeah, sure. Let's yeah. Five minute break. <laughs>
Okay, are folks coming back? Hopefully. Thank you, Paisa. Thank you, Jacob. I was muted. That never happens to anyone. So welcome back. And thank you for, uh, for the, uh, the great many mentors that have joined us today, in, in addition to our, our judges. And uh, three, three remarkable, great projects uh, down, two to go. And we welcome to the stage, to the mic, uh, team four, consisting of, of uh, am I right? Yeah, we just wrapped up with, uh, why am I thinking? There we are. Good, thank you. Team four is Javier and Dylan in Oakland, uh, Luis at Fremont, and Jacob uh, from down south in Templeton. And you guys, it's uh, it's all yours. Take it away. All right. So uh, our project is a water quality proposal for the small community uh, of the city of Parlier. Um, Parlier is a small community in the Central Valley um, with an approximately population of 15,000 people, um, a third of those people not having access to clean and safe drinking water, um, which is around 5,000 people. Um, so, and these people rely on the local government and local utilities to provide for the um, water that is mostly pumped from the ground, um, which comes from a local runoff um, from surrounding communities. Um, and next slide, please. 
Uh, the problem is that most of that water uh, is contaminated as it has uh, harmful pesticides and herbicides um, that come from local runoff of farms and uh, agricultural estab establishments. Um, many of those chemicals, as you can see in the bottom left, are almost 10 times the amount of adequate and or, or safe amounts that you're supposed to have in water. Um, while this is legal under federal um, law, EWG uh, has done studies and shown that these, while these chemicals aren't as harmful in the near term, in the long term, they cause cancer. Um, so while it is legal, it doesn't always mean safe. So, um, and these pesticides go right into the community's um, drinking water. Um, and next slide, please. And our solution would be reverse osmosis, which is a, a filtration system that gets rid of all the harmful chemicals. Um, as you can see, EWG outlined how reverse osmosis gets rid of all the harmful chemicals in Parlier's uh, community. Um, and the, we have a sink filter, as you can see in the top left. And next to that, we have a shower filter. And for the third option, we have a refrigerate, refrigerator uh, filter. And our fourth option um, is another option for uh, clean drinking water. Um, and we plan to distribute these um, in the community of Parlier. The budget total will be $76,000. So the money will go to filters, which will be 94% of the budget. And then that will be 71,500. The 71,500 will basically go, will all go to the four filters, which are the showerhead filters, ice filters, portable filters, and sink filters. Adds 4.5%. 4,500, the 4,500 dollars of ads will go to TV commercials and paper ads like flyers to show awareness to filtering water. Distribution, 1%, 1,000 dollars. The 1,000 on distribution will be going to people in the community. The educational talks, which will be 0.5% of the budget, which will be 500 dollars. The $500 on educational talks will be going to the community on what is important and the good effect for them having these type of filters. So for our timeline, we have um, four phases. So we're gonna start out with educating people. Um, so we educate them on the types of chemicals that are in their water and um, we also identify by just seeing the community what um, sort of filter they actually need. Like, do they need, you know, more like refrigerant or refrigerator filters or do they need um, more like sink filters um, or do they already have some filters or something like that? So maybe they only need um, like a jug or something like the really cheap one. Um, and then, um, the second phase, we actually get a physical location. So the, resili the resiliency hub, um, and we would, you know, learn where that needs to be by going into the community. So we don't want to just plop it down anywhere and it could just, um, you know, not be in a good place. And we want it to be in the center of the action where it's most needed. Um, three is we start to, give out more types of filters um, to the community. So after, you know, our, our focus, you know, type of filter. Um, and then, so, and then, it, you know, um, phase three also the community takes over. So the community starts to, we are getting enough funding that it can fund itself and the volunteers are basically sustaining it. Um, and then for, after, a while we take a survey, you know, every once in a while, and just to see how um, well our program is doing. So our scope uh, plan for this uh, resiliency hub will be first uh, to secure donations and partnerships. 
So when we do this, we will try to seek local, state, county, corporate, or nonprofit uh, help. Uh, next would be the community. So our specific community that we are uh, focusing on is Parlier. Um, so with this, we will uh, service them with the filters, as we mentioned uh, previously, and uh, get community like uh, get community help, like volunteers. Uh, these, yeah, these will be actual people from the community giving out filters and uh, hopefully donating. Uh, third is the outreach. So uh, we will reach out to these people and to the people in the community. For example, we will give educational info sessions to the donators and the uh, people of Parlier as well. Uh, we will also provide ads, as mentioned again before, um, with and pay and include surveys. These surveys would be, for example, like if we send out the surveys and get them back um, after about a week, and we see that 80 or 90% of the people say that their water is a lot better now, uh, we will be able to see from that that our uh, plan was successful. Uh, fourth is the partners. So our partnerships. Uh, we will partner, we plan to partner up with HydroViv, which is the company of, uh, that, that will be providing the filters <laughs> such as the sink filters and the refrigerator fil uh, filters. Uh, we will also be partnering with the city of Parlier, uh, the utility department, which provides water and waste um, yeah, uh, distribution. So the policy change. So we will hopefully get lawmakers around the area to increase the quality of water that, ha that, uh, that they order to go out into the community. Uh, and hopefully with that, the people won't be needing filters anymore. Uh, last, the environmental impact. Uh, so water provides, water is a huge asset in agriculture and Parlier is next to a lot of agricultural uh, areas. So we will talk to farmers with that and, and again, with surveys or just straight up asking them. Um, we will see how uh, these filters have um, impacted the, the, the food growth and if the water for them is uh, drinkable or us usable. Uh, next slide. So yeah, that's our presentation. Uh, thank you for listening again. Uh, we we want to thank uh, Tom Enriquez who helped us um, kind of the wording around all this uh, and he kind of helped us put it all together. So yeah, thank you. And then again, Barry Scott for initiating the, uh, the project as well. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you. Awesome, thank you guys. The uh, the uh, it's a it's a you're you're most welcome and it's always a, a pleasure to uh, to see you guys all of you uh, turn out such great great work. Um, so with that, I'll I'll give it to the judges. Uh, one second, we have a PSA as well. Oh, good. Yeah, I was wondering about that. Parlier, California has high levels of contaminants such as arsenic in its water system. In Parlier, one in three households don't have clean drinking water, so we want to distribute filters. We have four options, a sink, refrigerator, shower, and a cheaper option to fill all the community's needs. Donate to the Parlier Water Quality Project. Sweet. I like I like how you uh, you picked a tiny little town in the middle of the Central Valley that I, and I'm, I grew up in the kind of a tiny little town in the middle of the Central Valley. It's an actual place, Parlier. Cool stuff. Uh, to the judges. Yeah, I, I've got a, a question. I thought you I think you may have said this, but just wanted to uh, ask a little bit more. Yeah. 
I love how specific this is. You know, as Barry mentioned, that you really honed in on a specific community and a specific challenge they're facing. And oftentimes, when you come in to a small community like that with a solution, you know, it's really going to be really important to build trust that um, in in whatever the solution is that you're um, offering. And it it, uh, it sounded like you were going to be partnering with some of the local residents. And uh, I just wanted to maybe ask a little bit about kind of the execution of that. Is that, is that what, was what you were thinking? Um, and then the other thing is just the language barrier. I don't know if this is a predominantly Spanish speaking community or another uh, uh, language. Uh, and I think that's um, just an important consideration when you're really working at the grassroots level like that to make sure that um, uh, you know, you're able to communicate, especially something like this, which is like a technology, a little more technical. So I, I guess, can you talk a little bit about your thoughts of involving the community in the, um, in the implementation of this? Yeah. So, um, well, we actually did the research and it, it, it's surprisingly majority white. So, um, and there wasn't a lot of um, other English language learn or speakers, um, for, fortunately. Um, and so, yeah, we, we want, needed to go, uh, we wanted to go more in depth on how um, we plan to choose the community centers. So we were thinking of um, local churches or community centers um, to distribute it. Um, yeah. And as uh, I think Jacob said, we want to have it right in the middle of the impact zone. So um, yeah, people would just come to these um, locations as they saw on like commercials or ads or flyers and, um, that yeah, we would be giving them out um, uh, with the many options that we have. No, it's very smart. Um, and maybe just one follow on it. It's a technology, you know, that you're offering um, and uh, it's gonna require you know, a little technical skill, you know, whether you're adding it to your sink or, or something like that. Is there any, have you thought about any um, technical assistance or uh, efforts you, you hand it to the person you know at the community center mm -hmm. or what have you, but you know they may not know how to actually do it. Um, yeah, I just wondered if that was part of the, the program as well. Yeah, so we were um, that would be included in the educational talk so um, that we uh, laid out uh, earlier, and yeah, they would hopefully learn from that, and then hopefully the volunteers would who would be taught and then pass it on, they could help with the installation. Um, once there had already been, um, the, the community had been established to help each other out. I love that. So it's like a new twist on the volunteer, get people that are a little more technically savvy, you know, to help there. Uh, I think it's great. Thank you. Uh, quick question. So um, early on in your presentation, you talked about the difference between um, the safe to drinking water and and something else. It, it's just you know based on on what I what I what, what I researched um, recently during your presentation. I see that um, there has been zero violations in you know according to the Safe Drinking Water Act in, in that city. Um, can you provide us a little bit more information on how you guys <coughs> came up with the facts that you came up with because i just looking at the city's um, website this is something that 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 showed up right away but you guys had percentages and stuff like that yeah Where so you... mm, sorry okay, go ahead. um go ahead. yeah so uh in our research we um we yeah we we found also that federally they and state they had not violated any um uh drinking water but um, as we learned, EWG is a very reputable um, nonprofit and um, conducts studies on cities like these. And we found that um, through their criteria and um, many other uh, environmental protection uh, uh, re research, uh, that th those are levels of chemicals that are that cause long-term risk. Um, and while they may not show up immediately. Um, for the impact of the people later on, they have a uh, significant um, cancer risk. So, um, yeah. You know, worth, worth considering, right? Maybe working with the city to try and evaluate what, what their criteria are for um, saying that it's, you know, saying that it's safe. 
Um, but yeah, thanks for, uh, that was kind of a tough question. So thanks for answering. And um, thank you for, for the presentation. And again, another good, um, good concept. Um, I'm gonna ask about your budget. And I, I had to step away for a minute, so you may have covered this. I see that you allocated uh, about 76,000 for um, equipment and education. Where would you use the other 24,000 in this grant of 100,000? Um, I'll answer this one. So we would have the majority of our budget going to the filters and then the, the rest we want to go to different things like ads, distribution, and um, you know, like the talks, like there may be like, you have to buy like a little thing for the talk or something, because there's always, something always comes up. Um, but we, we wanted to have a, you know, a part of the budget set aside just for the little things, because you don't want to go over budget because of little things, right? Um, so that's, that was kind of why we had kind of that part of it like that. Agreed. Incidentals always, there's always a cost. There's always an expense that oh, is yeah. un, un, um, expected. So, so I appreciate that forethought and great presentation. Real quick, I apologize. Yeah, great presentation. I forgot to start with that. That was, that was really, really well done. I remember uh, that that they had in a re rehearsal yesterday one slide that had had a lot of detailed information there about the the how that there are guidelines and then there are recommendations and you can kind of be you might not be out of compliance but there can still be a concern with levels of arsenic and whatnot and so I thought it was a kind of a, a, a an exploratory uh, well, it's a big challenge too. You're dealing with water and a city uh, utility, and and uh, possibly differing views on what's healthy in in your water in terms of contaminants. Uh, and I was surprised, I was shocked to find that the arsenic levels were as high as they are, for whatever reason. And you know, I think all of our projects have room for further study. It was like, well, if we had another few weeks to this, maybe we would dig deep, deeper on into why why is it polluted in the first place? Uh, so it's an interesting project. All of them are, of course. Did we hear from all the judges? Chris, did we hear from you? Yeah, yeah, I was asking about uh, just working with the community and yeah. okay. how they would execute it. Good, I, I, um, I just sent to the judges a, an Excel spreadsheet version of the score sheet in case that makes it easier to uh, tally up scores later. So I was, I was a bit distracted there. Uh, good job, guys. And that leaves us one team, team five, uh, consisting of, uh, again, students from different high schools, all four different high schools, different cities even. Vin Long is from Oakland. Uh, Amish is from Dublin. Uh, Sri Lakshmi is from Fremont. And Bennett from Templeton High School, all over the service area, these kids. So take it away, team five. Uh, yeah, one second. I, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, hello, everybody. As Barry already said, I'm Bennett Wilson. I'm Sri Lakshmi Verma. I'm Vin Luang. I'm Amish Saini, and this is our Capstone Resiliency Hub project on wildfires. Uh, next slide, please. So as all of us are aware, wildfires have become an increasingly severe problem in our home state of California. So let's run down some statistics. Last year, just shy of 2.6 million acres of land burned. But loss of forest land being lost is not our only problem. In 2020 alone, 112 million metric tons of carbon dioxide were released into the atmosphere from California wildfires. The crisis looms over us now with 4.6 million homes being at elevated risk for wildfire today. As is seen in the article heading provided, it is very easy for a wildfire to start with lawn fires becoming especially problematic. With such a destructive threat and weight, we decided to look at one of the highest risk communities in California. So the specific community we decided to choose was La Sierra Hills in Riverside, California. This city is at the highest risk for wildfires in the state as it is close to a dry and fire susceptible forest land as seen marked in red on the slide. 
There is a rather small population of around 5.4 thousand residents and the population is very diverse. Our plan is a three-step program called EIA. First off is education. We will educate the citizens of La Sierra Hills on how to counteract and prevent the cause of wildfires. Secondly, we will start the implementation of lo turf lawns and water tanks. Then lastly, we will develop and advocate for groups in La Sierra Hills to continue with our plan. Uh, we also plan to educate the community on how to deal with wildfires and if possible, prevent them from happening in the first place. So we plan to educate people in churches, schools, and local community centers. This will effectively target children so they can grow up and have good practices and adults who can teach what they learn to their kids. We would educate about best practices, like don't leave the stove on or to cut away dead plants. And we would also teach generic wildfire prevention and how to conserve water so it can be used effectively, effectively against wildfires when needed. Our implementation phase contains two types of assets. The first is turf lawns. Turf is inflammable and requires no maintenance at all. Such turf will eliminate the risk of lawn fires and significantly decrease water usage. We will initially have an installation crew provided with our budget, but as the program gets rolling, we anticipate having volunteer installation from the community so they can really get involved. We plan to fully fund four turf lawns and sponsor eight other lawns by paying for half of the installation. The second asset is two 5,000 gallon water tanks installed next to the high hazard fire zone. These water tanks will provide an emergency water supply in the case that fire does break. So the last and final phase of our plan is advocacy, which involves picking a select group of community volunteers to continue our program. We will conduct interviews and background screening to pick a passionate and talented group of volunteers. This group will continue edu educating other communities at high risk and allow our program to self-sustain. With advocacy, we can spread this program to other cities or even states, and they can also have the opportunity to re reduce their wildfire risk. The benefits of this plan include reduced risk of wildfire, better infrastructure to stop wildfires, reduce water bill, and vol volunteer work which would bring the community get together, and lastly, the long-term continu continuity of the project is beneficial as well. So our timeline. During our first month, we would develop the curriculum and market to our target audience. At, towards the end of the first month and throughout our second month, we would educate the community. There would be weekly about 90 minute long sessions. Throughout months three, four, and five, we would implement turf lawns, and in month five, we would also implement the water tanks. After that, it's all about advocacy. And we can measure the impact that we have on how many people will join the program and uh, how many wildfires there are after our program is introduced. So as you can see here, we have a detailed breakdown of our expenditures. A very large chunk of our budget goes towards the equipment for installing turf lawns and water tanks. However, we were really decided to hone in on spreading our message. So we split the remaining $30,000 into marketing and an inline and in-person in ads, sorry, and education development. If the project is to go beyond a first grant, we would also prop up fundraising campaigns as we really want to get the people the infrastructure that they need to protect themselves from uh, we have a video to show you, so let me set that up real quick. In the past five years, California averaged 8,607 wildfires and more than 1.6 million acres burned. As the climate crisis continues to worsen, so too will the size and destructiveness of these fires. So today we are here to propose our Wildfire Resiliency Plan EIA. This plan employs a three-pronged attack to help the residents of La Sierra Hills in Riverside, California to take charge of their own wildfire safety. The three phases of our plan include education, E, implementation, I, and advocacy, A. Starting off with phase one, education. This involves educating the community members on wildfire safety, prevention, and water conservation. Phase two focuses on the installation of turf lawns and water tanks. Phase three is advocacy. This involves making the residents advocate for their own wildfire safety and continue to spread the program. And finally, thank you. Thank you for watching our presentation. Thanks for watching our video. Thank you.
so that's uh, our presentation. <laughs> poor judges. You poor judges. <laughs> you have five fantastic projects. So let's, uh, do we have any questions for group five uh, or comments from our judges, please? Oh, shit. Maybe just one question for you guys. Um, first of all, I love the branding, the EIA. It's very cool. Uh, it's a nice, nice succinct way, succinct way to present. The, and it's memorable in terms of your strategy. But I also, uh, clearly you guys had kind of re rehearsed this and, and I love how you were, uh, even just how you introduced yourself and, and, and uh, had different people, you know, kind of talking in a, in a very, um, kind of handing it off very smoothly. So it shows a lot of teamwork and collaboration and preparation. So just uh, wanted to commend you guys for that. You know, the only thought I had for you, uh, and I don't know if this is something that you talked about, but just in terms of like sustainability and just knowing how dry it is <clears throat> in that area, you know, clearly the, uh, the idea of like the, these turf lawns is one way to go, but wondering if you also talked about uh, just you know more um, drought resistant natural landscaping that communities could do or homeowners could do that might be a more nature-based solution uh, within the home uh, within the, the landscaping of the property um, and I was just kind of curious if that's something that you talked about and, or you thought could be incorporated into the, the planning not that you would necessarily be paying for it, but more educational about how you can make your, your home, your neighborhood's landscaping more, more nature-based, drought resistant, that sort of a thing. Uh, yes, thank you for your question. I was researching because we wanted to try to marry two seemingly opposite uh, concepts, you know, water conservation and fire, wildfire safety. So I thought of different ways that people, you know, you don't want, some people don't want to get a full turf lawn implemented. That seems a little scary. It seems a little new. So what people could do is instead of having more water leaching uh, plants and decorative flowers and replace them with succulents because succulents, I, you barely need to give them any, if not any water at all. So you could replace your decorative plants with more succulents. I mean, you can have agave, you can have cacti, there's a lot of good looking succulents out there that you can use to replace to uh, in the place of decorations. And kind of adding on to what, um, Bennett as well, I think um, drought resistance plants, they like when you're completely changing your um, lawn up, it can require a lot more planning than just implementing a turf lawn, which is often a lot more simple. So I think that's why we decided to go with this aspect of it. But um, in our educational presentations, of course, we would teach about the drought resistant plants as well. So that's an open option for anyone who wants to consider that instead. Yeah, it's funny. I speak from experience. We had um, converted our, our lawn to just all native. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a, you know, until you actually get into it, you realize how many things, and it's just crazy if you stop and think about it, people are planting that are not native. And so, you know, we live in a very dry state, particularly in Southern California, extremely dry, which is why the fire risk is so high and getting worse. And so if you actually plant things that are native, makes sense, right? They're, they're used to yeah. the conditions because they just grow naturally. And and I agree with you completely that um, one way to think about this is there's the upfront cost and that's the, there's the ongoing maintenance. And the benefit of, of using more natural and drought resistant um, vegetation is there's definitely a cost associated with the initial switch, but then you're not paying for all that water or just ongoing you know, maintenance uh, of it. And um, uh, so, uh, and it's, it's sort of a growing, um, community here within the state around that. But uh, anyway, I just uh, appreciate that you guys thought about that and glad to hear that that was part of the plan. Yep. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful presentation, guys. Um, actually, we just did something at, at, at our home also in Petaluma, which is really, you know, some, we, we remodeled the landscape and stuff. Um, I'm just curious what your thoughts on this is. Um, I, I actually weighed back and forth on doing the, 
you know, the artificial lawn versus, you know, rocks and stuff like that and native plants. Um, aesthetically, <laughs> I guess I'm trying to figure out how, how to word it. Um, do you think there will be some resistance in, in people using this because of the way that it looks? I think I can take this one because I have personal experience with turf lawns. My uncle in Cambria, which is a small coastal town just outside of, uh, he actually has a, a turf lawn. And at first glance, you really wouldn't notice it ever. Uh, one of the added benefits of turf lawns is that they're always green. You never have to worry about committing more water to keep it green. So I feel like a lot of people's initial resistance is just because it's so foreign. You know, we've had lawns for hundreds of years so i feel like once we really show them the benefits of you don't have to mow it ever you don't have to commit water to it i feel like that'll really get them excellent excellent okay and going back to your budget um you guys really did a good job i think in in breaking it down is, is it possible to go back to the to the slide um yeah yeah, yeah. one second thanks ben I really like your timeline also. Can you explain the the whole, the marketing aspect of this Facebook? Um, the flyers I can kind of understand, YouTube. Can you t explain the, the whole social media side of so this? So the way, the way the way social media marketing works is basically you buy a slot in, in the marketing, like advertisement. And so, mm -hmm. Like per slot is gonna cost, or like per showing is gonna cost you like 20 cents. So basically we're just gonna have a bunch, we're just gonna buy a bunch of those slots so that we can outreach the community of Lost Sierra Hills. Uh, you could have your avatars, advertisements be for specific people in an area and not like have random advertisements in like Seattle. That would be like weird. But like, if you just have like, advertisements for again the people of Los Sierra Hills it's not going to cost you a lot and like they're going to get the word out yeah they might skip the ads but you will you might have like a certain few of people who like will actually look at those ads and kind of adding on to Vin um for how it works is for YouTube you pay per view so the 20 cents is for every time the YouTube ad shows up before a video and then for pace for Facebook you pay per click so every time someone clicks on the ad in Facebook you're paying the 97 cents and then flyers are pretty self-explanatory great thank you yeah no problem Did, uh, did Alicia have something to say? And if and if she does go, go for it. And then Elias has a hand up. We have a student. Student question. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll just quickly say that, um, again, I love the involvement of your team. You work well and seamlessly. Um, I also like the message of personal responsibility, having a collective community impact. Um, in terms of the water tanks, were those solely for um, water capture or reuse? Um, can somebody just address a, just a little bit more detail on the water tanks? Uh, I think for the water tanks, it's mostly we're going to have them like, I guess, around like where the wildfire is going to most be prevalent. Mm -hmm. And then just have firefighters use that water tank or like the local people use it. Again, okay. with the education part of the program is to teach people about wildfires and also how to prevent and stop them. So they can also learn how to use these water tanks in order to extinguish a fire or I don't know. Mm -hmm. No, hey, you know, at least if there's a collective um, source and people are using it responsibly, uh, and there are a lot of other ways to, to um, feed any water reuse um, programs or opportunities into an infrastructure like that. So great presentation and and very good concept. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Uh, before I, be, I, I I'm going to recognize Elias, but I, I want to say that one of the requirements of this project for the students, and it was easier maybe they they all of them I think had uh, uh, their challenges fulfilling this requirement, but the the requirement was that they reach out to local area agencies to learn uh, to actually have conversations with some of the uh, what could be a water agency, it could be a fire prevention or emergency services. And all of these communities are differently able to pick up a phone, 
call <laughs> or, or respond to. So a lot of our time this past week has been, you know, try this phone number, try that phone number. And they all of them got a hold of somebody, but they, I just want to recognize every team for the effort that they showed. They weren't just going by websites, you know, they're having conversations just as we would need to in the real world. So good job. Elias, what, what's your question or comment, sir? Uh, so I was wondering for the about the turf lawns aspect of it. Uh, turf lawns, like, they definitely like use less water uh, and they're also like not going to spread fire as much, but they're also made out of plastic. And that's like, there's a whole reason, a lot of reasons why plastic is bad. And also when fire combines with plastic, burning plastic is also really bad. So if fire were to happen, do you think you guys could consider moving to like a natural option, sort of like what Chris was saying, uh, like an option for turf made with natural resources that wouldn't, uh, burn, but also wouldn't have like the negative effects of creating and burning plastic does. Okay, so I can take this one kind of addressing that one of the points you brought up about like um, the uh, turf lawn catching on fire. I think the whole reason that we focus on turf lawns is because they don't like spontaneously catch on fire. Like you can light the turf lawn, but um, it's not as flammable as just dried grass, which is um, like out in the forest next to the city. So yeah, that's one of the- Yeah, that makes sense. Also, adding on to Sir Lakshmi's uh, point is that fire, plastic does not really combust like at the highest temperatures. What would most likely happen if there was a fire around a turf lawn is that the edges of it might get a little melted, but other than that, it would mostly stay completely intact and wouldn't release any harmful uh, substances into the atmosphere, which could cause more problems. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Thanks for answering my question. Love it. Well, good job teams. Uh, now, now our three judges have the un unenviable task of um, going off to a breakout room that I'm about to create right now and discussing the, the individual scores across those uh, 10, 10 criteria. Uh, because you, you really, you all of you did a great job and, and I, I am, uh, I'm impressed with the work that they're about to do, trying to figure out uh, the scores for everyone and, and what, whatever the outcome, I just think everybody did an amazing job and, and, you know, Alicia, we can say this much, can't we, the, uh, this, this is the best set of projects that we've seen ever, right? I think, I think that's fair to say. I give a big hands up to everybody and all the presentations in this cohort. You did a great job. And you you definitely read the assignment and you followed it. I appreciate that. And yeah. chosen this great work product. All of you, proud of you. Great job. So hey, hey Barry, can I just tell a quick funny story? Yes, I don't know please. if we're all gonna get back together or not. Yeah, well, we, we were hoping to, but uh, uh, I, I want to hear your story anyway. <clears throat> so it's a funny little little known fact that, that I made up this program um, that we're talking about here. And um, uh, it's, it was based on a grant that we gave to Oakland. Uh -huh. And we were trying to come up with a, uh, uh, a new program at PG&E to, to provide resilience. And uh, we, the, the program that we had funded uh, in Oakland was, was really successful. We thought, huh, maybe we can scale that. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, we need to come up with a name for it. So we came up with the name Resilience Hubs and it's a new program at pg and Last year was the first year. And we were real careful in not being too specific about how we were defining a Resilience Hub. Because if you're too specific that it has to be yeah. a physical location for this kind of a thing, then we would limit cr the creative of like how a hub could be. And um, and so last year was the first year we put this out as a competitive grant. We got a great response and uh, a number of communities, tribes won the grants. And uh, what's really cool about it is to see how you guys thought about what a, a hub could be mm -hmm. and how it would face different climate risks. And um, uh, and it's just really funny to see, you know, that was a, probably about, I don't know, a couple of years ago when it was, and now it's a real thing. It's a real program. 
Uh, we're going to be launching year two uh, in, uh, in a couple of weeks and putting it out. It's a five-year program at PG&E. And the, what you guys just went through is, is, a, is a real world thing that tribes and local governments and communities are going to be doing in, in just probably about a month when this RFP is out and they're going to be coming up with projects and they're going to be applying to pg e for real money and real grants and going through the exact same thing. And you did a mini, this is a real, you know, this is a mini exercise, but I just, I love the, how creative you were in thinking about climate change, the risks our communities face and kind of like, what a hub could be and, uh, and, and how you really brought it back to vulnerable communities. These are real people, you know, that live in California that are suffering and face these risks and sh putting yourself in their shoes, thinking about, you know, sites that would be convenient for them uh, is, is the right way to think. And um, so anyway, I just wanted to um, uh, applaud you for the work and just uh, how you've, you've really demonstrated the, uh, innovation um because that, that's really the idea behind this program at pg e so it's pretty cool thank you chris and it's, it, it it is uh it's truly special that you're here because i you know we we worked from that grant we worked from that page that was our 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 starting point and it's the, and the last thing i was thinking you know right. it's definitely <laughs> isaacson and i you know kind of wrote this up and figured this yeah. out is that now a couple of years later you know, you guys as students would be thinking about, you know, what you could do with it. So it, it, in life, there's a lesson there, right? Just go for it, you yeah. know, and you, you really never know the ripple effect that you can cause. Um, yeah. And each of you are going to be able to do that in your careers. So just be bold, be insightful, and, and really keep the community in mind. You cannot go wrong when you're thinking about how you can serve other people and, you um, uh, and you'll you'll do great things. So sorry to, for interrupting there, Barry. Not, not at all, Chris. Thank you. And honestly, the uh, resilient the concept of resiliency hubs is the perfect. I just thought it was the I was so lucky I felt to find it, and it's the perfect platform here because these kids and I told them from the beginning, and we keep reminding them they're gonna they're gonna fix the mistakes of the past. They're gonna step up, and they have ideas that we don't have because we've been around too long. They have fresh ideas. They have open minds. They think bigger thoughts than, than than most of us are capable of. And that's why it's so exciting to give them an opportunity to say, what would you do about this? What would you do? And, and again, in, in a shorter term, that last group of 15 students was working over 10 weeks. I think this group has been working over just, this is their fifth week, shorter time frame, amazing stuff. So um, when we, we will, hopefully our judges will be able to stick around after you've uh, done your scoring and come back in and announce our winners. Uh, I'm going to keep, uh, I'm going to keep the, I'm going to create two breakout rooms that you can self-select to go into. All the interns uh, stay in the main room. I really only need to create, uh, and I'm going to, and, and, uh, like we did last time, Alicia, you and I can stay in touch through text message in our little sidebar, right? That's right, exactly. And I'll just for the judges, Gina and Chris, we'll, um, we're going to have a hard stop because I can tell you right now, this is a tough deliberation. We'll mm -hmm. have a hard stop at, at 515 if you can stay with us. I know that um, it'll be after five, so I understand if, if you do have to attend to other issues, but we'll have a hard stop at 515. Sounds good. Okay. okay. There's going to be a, a, a room one and a room two, and I'm going to ask the judges and, you know, the mentors can stay. I don't know. Uh, I think we'll just have the mentors stay with us and we can have some chit chat. Room one is for judges and you will self-select if you know how to do that. I'm going to open the both rooms. Everyone stay in the main room unless you're a judge. I can probably assign things. Let me all assign people. Hang on. I can do that. Alicia. And where are you, Regina and Chris Benjamin? Yeah, I'm just going to stick you in a room. And there you go. And uh, you can leave the room at will, but I'll be in touch with, with Alicia over here. And thanks, you guys. We're opening the rooms. We're sending you off. Hope this works. So join your rooms, judges, and good luck. Here they go. Nice job, you guys. 
Thank you. I, uh, yeah, I'm just really happy with the, uh, and you know, I'm also happy too. I got to tell you, because I would be, uh, I'd be getting sad or something because oh, it's the end of another internship and there goes my class and I'll never see him again. But that's not what it's going to be this time, Tom. It's, yeah, it's going to be a tough decision. You all did a great job and a lot of hard work that went into this every single hour and minute. And uh, today it paid off because every single presentation was excellent. Yeah. And uh, you'll be able to take this with you. Uh, the experience and uh, your individual as well as your team team efforts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so like I said, the, what's what's cool is that we have other. I was just. I'm going to spend a little time tomorrow looking up the my last crop of interns, the 15 who were from different schools in different cities, like you, and they're their mentors, many of whom are different. Um, and some of them have stayed in touch with one another, the one-to-one -one mentor and the, and the students. I just wrote to Ozzy Guzman uh, uh, to see if he was still in touch with his, his uh, uh, mentee, and they are. He said, oh, great. We've been, yeah, they're like checking in about once a month, but I'm going to invite them back to join us uh, in the opportunities for field trips, and, you know, if they're interested. But you guys, for sure, we're going to be setting up some uh, some some things like we want we want to make sure you have created a LinkedIn profile and join a group because as Tom indicates it's the it's the it's a serious business side of networking uh, and it has a lot of functionality that's like Facebook you can follow groups join groups drop out of groups and people will re I forget the numbers there like how many jobs are found and positions made it was in the thousands tom when you, your presentation there's some crazy number how many jobs are filled per minute or something crazy oh on linkedin yeah 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 now it's uh, nuts i have to go back and look but it's i think it's like 10 or 15 like yeah that. you know and you guys we're going to meet tomorrow and we're going to go over some things like and i have notes here uh, a little bit of housekeeping business because it's really important uh, a question for all. Did you receive and respond to the W-9 form completion? Everybody? Everybody looking for the thumbs up? Okay. Um, I actually had a question about that. Yes. Nishita. Is the information that we fill out on that form like ours or our parents? It's It should all be for you as almost like you were a, just as you would if you were going to get it, take a job at IBM or Safeway or anybody, it's it's your it's it's the equivalent of uh, a tax reporting. It's gonna you know it's got to be recorded as reported as income. So you're the you're the person, you're the individual. And let me see if I can uh, even maybe find that because I I filled it out myself and I, I wanted to be sure um, I wanted to be sure that it was that the that the instructions I sent were not. Um, What's the word for it? That they were comprehensible. When did I send that? Yesterday? W9, I got to do a search for it. Um, but that, that's the answer to that question. Um, it's a, uh, it's for you and, uh, you know, your home address, your birth date, uh, your stipend requires you. So here we go. Foundation Jot Forum Carcat 2021. So I, I assume that you haven't done it yet, and that's okay. And it's good that you asked the question. What? Oh, I see. We need another letter there. Wrong. Wrong password. It said. Here we go. All right. Let's do a screen share. Brave browser work. Okay. All right, so request for taxpayer identification. And so your, your email address, your first name, yeah, I'm not filling it out so you can see, uh, your last name, business entity, you leave that blank, you click individual sole proprietor, you don't have anything to put in here. Uh, so you leave that 
a loan. You come down, you put your address, and that is uh, includes the apartment number, city, state, zip. You don't need to list an account number. Um, you don't need to list a requester name. Then down here, you only need to put in your social security number. You don't need to put in an employee identification number. Then you sign here just like that. Leave the date is fine. And the important thing is you can preview and save the, the PDF, but for them to receive it, you have to hit the submit button. And that's what will permit them to, where to go? There. That's what permits them to have you on file. And the way work, who is it? Salesforce is handling this. And for everybody to get paid, I need everybody to submit their W-9. Um, and that's, and, and if I don't, whatever number have submitted, I, I will be submitting the form and might have to do another round if people are, uh, and I know of at least one, one intern that's, uh, has reasons for waiting and that's okay. So everybody that can should and get that done tonight if they haven't done it already. Um, and yeah, and the other thing is, has everyone made a LinkedIn page? Oh, wait, we have a hand up Bennett. Yes, thanks. So be thinking about that. Who needs more time to do a LinkedIn page? We need to see the LinkedIn page. Is that a Luis needs more time? And Javier needs more time? No problem. No problem. We have more time. We have one more day <laughs> of actual regular work. And we're going to come together again next week. I'm waiting to hear. I want to I want to get the word from. Uh, um, and I don't know what everybody's parent or guardian interest and in le level of availability is for joining a four o'clock virtual celebration. Thank you. Event on Tuesday or Wednesday, say, or Thursday. But do be thinking about that. We're going to try to we're going to try to nail down the time, uh, and we want your input so that we can just send the invitation out tomorrow and give our mentors and parents uh, as much notice as possible. All right. So graduation next week. Good times. Uh, LinkedIn needs to be done. Your W nine forms need to be in. And um, tomorrow we're going to be. I want to review uh, the different assignments that you've done. And I know. Probably not everybody has completed every single assignment, and that's okay. But some of you have done, for example, a video of your first project, of your very first project. Who remembers what their very first project was? Huh? Let me see. Did I keep track of it? I think I did. So somebody I see, I see, I have a, Bennett has a hand up and then Marianne has a hand up too. So Bennett, comment or question? Uh, I just had a question on what the timeline you think is for receiving our stipend. Um, if, all, if all goes well, maybe the end of the next week in the mail, via pay card, credit card, debit card, by the way. And he's on the phone. Uh, I thought I saw Marianne's hand up, but I see Paisa's hand up. Nope. Paisa. Um, I had done both the video and I finished the cer certification. Should we just email those to you? Yeah, that'd be great. But but also make sure you have a hard copy to put in your uh, resume because one of the things we're going to be wanting, one of the things that we're going to be ask, offering to help you with is a resume. Constructing a resume and including that uh, your certificates in that as an attachment, uh, and you know, in a perfect world, we do all of the all of the above. Um, creating your a resume, a kind of a stock resume, and, and if you'll remember from our presentation with uh, Tom and uh, Al, I've forgotten her name. Tom, who presented with you, Allison? Allison. Al yeah. Um, uh, you you sometimes have a standard resume and you might change a few things like strong points to suit the job application. But we would love for all of you to develop a resume, including this summer fellowship and your certifications. And you can post that to your LinkedIn profile, right, Tom? That's correct. You can, you can post it there. You can also post it to the pg and &E careers page um, as, as an attachment. That was one of the 
very earliest things we did on a tour. Marianne has a hand up. Hi, Marianne. Hi, I was just wondering, um, is the website that we use to like get the certifications, are we gonna eventually gonna like lose our account or can we continue using that throughout? Oh, yeah, ab absolutely. It's your account forever. Good okay. question. Great question. And we should probably, you know, maybe try to take time to revisit that after this internship, after this official fellowship is over. Um, I didn't spend nearly as much time as I might have. There was a speaker we had with the last group of um, interns who gave us a tour of the of that site. It's kind of it's kind of it, it, it's a it's the it's the kind of thing that we should do right about now, as opposed to right in the beginning, because I think you guys are a lot more savvy about the company and the you know what what some of the different terminology is that you encounter when you go to the career site. I think you have a much, much better idea of, you know, understanding there's a gas side and there's an electric side, but there's also this whole universe of other careers, right? That have to do with customer care, climate, environmental response, um, community support. So that it'd be kind of interesting to go back to that career page and spend a little time with it. But, you definitely want to keep those keep those accounts fresh, and just as I said, we could add you can add your uh, LinkedIn to your LinkedIn profile. You can upload your resume and your certifications. The PG&E website is exactly where you can do the same thing. You have uh, the careers page has um, a whole section, and we should probably do a little lesson on that. Uh, we certainly could, um, you know, revisit. You know, as a part of to follow up with the resume working, working on resumes uh, and bringing them to um, to your LinkedIn profile, we could spend a little time getting you back on the, the pg and &E page and uploading your, your cert certificates because that makes perfectly good sense. And I'm, I'm not kidding you when I say you get... Um, when you, when you sign up and you indicate to pg e that you have uh, an interest in this field or that field and you're looking for this kind of work and these are your qualifications, uh, the way you set up your, your job preferences, you'll, you'll begin to get, um, you'll begin to get notifications, right? And uh, I'm checking to see if I, once a week I get a whole slew of them, PGE. Let's see. I'm going to see if I can find new jobs posted from it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, new jobs posted. Hello. There we go. So we're back to another screen share. Hang on, I'll show you what I'm talking about. Um, because I do have an account. Not that I'm looking for work at PGE, although. Uh, you never know. Let's see, Brave Browser, here we go. So this is my email inbox where I've registered for, so July 2nd, July 6th, June 18th. These are uh, notifications. Expert incident respond, response analyst, cool. In Concord, senior technical training instructor, journeyman lineman, San Jose, Livermore, San Jose, Livermore again. Look at the senior technical training instructor. Tom, I could come and work for you. Apprentice communications tech, Monterey, IBEW. And that's that's an apprentice level. General construction, IBEW. That that would be pretty uh, Monterey. Who doesn't want to be in Monterey, man? Um, oh, this is a good one. Yeah. This apprentice uh, communications check, go down to the minimum qualifications. This is minimum qualification to do this job. Uh, right. Okay, minimum 18, high school diploma, California driver's license. Got to be able yeah. to maintain all these different weather extremes. And notice, don't need to go to college, don't need to go to a trade school. Yeah. Uh, this job starts at 100 and. Eighteen, sixteen thousand dollars a year with no overtime. I I have the flyer for that when I was at Laney College. I remember that. I didn't know that. If I knew this, if I knew this job, I would do this job. If I if I was your age. <laughs> no kidding, right? 
Yeah. And this is a cool job too, because you you're out you're out there, you're either in a like a massive data center, um, mm -hmm. you know, doing cabling or wiring Cat five or six or working with servers, uh, or you're or you're you're climbing uh, not the telephone pole and not the not the utility poles, but the actual uh, different um, apparatus uh, to get up and and do satellite dishes and whatnot. So if you like working with your hands, like being outside, it's not a bad job. In the Monterey Bay area, Tom. It's actually throughout our regions. Well, so then you, get to you could apply to that, and the recruiter would say, "Oh, wow, you're in, you're in Calistoga." Like, so every region has openings. Well, it's pretty pretty cool. And then you you know, apprentice communication, some basic skills tests. Yeah, yeah. I put the link in the uh, chat if anyone wants to just check that out. Um, so cool stuff. Does anyone have a video that they have made of their original first project that they'd like to share? I'm looking at people. I see you. <laughs> Come on, Bennett. You know you got something. Luis, did you do a little video? Who's done one? Yes, you did. And forgive me for forgetting who sent me their video. Some of you might be shy. Uh, and I know who else has a presentation and and I think because, um, and I don't see, let me see, is these poor judges, man. Did, did Alicia say she had a hard stop at 5.15, one minute from now? I think so. Because last, in January, in February, when we did the last round, I swear they're out for 45 minutes. And, and I was texting them and they're just like, we can't, it's so hard. <laughs> And it is. I wouldn't know. Just you know, gosh, it's the uh, hard part. I'm. Uh, I'm really. I. I don't know. Delighted. I guess happy that uh, the way Chris Benjamin is. You know, he. We responded to you all. Responded to a project that he he put put out there and and supports and this whole idea of resiliency hubs, resilience hubs. Um, you know, when I was your age, that wasn't a thing. There's no such thing. We were, what were we thinking about? We we're just coming off of the idea that you better have, you better know what to do in the case of a nuclear war. We had your duck and cover, right, Tom? Duck and yeah, cover. Yeah, duck, cover, and hold. Yeah. Um, earthquake preparedness. And and I remember the, the unseasonable wildfires that used to be just one certain part of the year and then the term then this is the new normal which is like year-round fire season geez and you know extended drought in california and really weird weather patterns everywhere else so here we are resiliency hubs so unfortunately a probably a growing growing need and a great opportunity to, to be Use your imagination like you have been. To talk. Hey, Barry. It's Paul here. Just, Hi, Paul. Uh, I just want to mention and just compliment all the teams here on the really outstanding uh, presentations by all. I think um, yeah. uh, really impressive. A lot of effort, uh, time, energy, and, and a lot of experience in, uh, put into this. I think that. Um, Given the fact that it's you know real world issues that we're dealing with, um, I think everyone should be proud of themselves, themselves and what they've done here. Um, and and even even beyond this, there is and and Barry, you know this in, in terms of um, uh, the UN seventeen sustainable goals, right? Those big goals across the planet. Um, they're they're out there they're on their website the UN website and and um, in essence you're kind of tackling that head on mm -hmm. um, so it, it's it's a California issue but it's it's a global issue too yeah um, so I think you're tapping into something that has um, uh, bigger implications um, um, with due respect to the state um, but it, it's a big deal you know this is we're getting wildfires in Europe and places and, and Scandinavia even and, and what have you that the uh, other parts of the world can actually learn from. So I just want to share that perspective 
and and um, encourage the team here um, I am to to pursue this these efforts mm -hmm. um, because there's it's it's a it's a global call. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for the reminder that um, you know the the uh, there are there are, there are so many, and you're involved with some of them. World Economic Forum, for example, and uh, the so many great resources and efforts. Uh, I can share the screen for the the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals. I think this is what you're talking about. Um, there it is. Yeah, I think we're 17. I, I have it working in my, my system here as well. I can't find it, but... Um, Are these, does this look familiar? It, they have all those icons and you... Yeah. As you, nope. you're right. nope. uh, uh, is, that, is that screen sharing yet? No, not yet. Hang on. Yeah. Here we go. Is this it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. It's pretty interesting because when you go to that website, it, it drills into the case studies behind each of those subjects. Yeah. Um, and um, it has a lot of valuable information. And you guys are touching on some key points here that could have a, a, a global impact. Right. So don't under, underestimate the work that you're doing. Not at all. Um, let me see. I'm going to see if this other... Uh... A couple of things. Come on, except there's actually a short video here. I think this is a short video. Yeah, two minutes. Just follow me through. All you do is click on the connect button right here. Watch this. Here we go. We click on connect, and then we start. We get the familiar screen, and then we scroll down and watch what happens. Here it comes. We have been waiting for this for so long. The Sustainable Development Goals widget, and it is really, really smart. Take a look at some of the things you can do to embed it on your website. For example, you can move across here and have a look at the titles of the SDGs or rather the detail. And then if you click this little blue button right there, bang, you've copied that to the clipboard and then you can paste it on your website in whatever way you like. This one down here is pretty interesting. When you click it, you get to see the B1G1 response to the global goals, and you can clip that on your website too. But have a look at this. There's a little customize button right down here. So for example, you can customize it. You can customize the font size. Take a look, I've just taken it down. You can customize the type of font to fit in with uh, your own site. There I said small widgets. Look, bang, little tiny ones. Here I'm going to zoom in, and what am I going to do right here? Let's have a look. Oh, we're going to get text only, which is what it says. So it just sits there, and the, the goals themselves become transparent. Talking of transparent, when you click this button, what happens is you can fit it to any color website that you like. Now let's go back, and so you can see it in its glory. Have a look. Here we go. Just winding up. There we go. Look at that. And it's all there for you right now. Now, isn't that stunning? And I hope worth waiting for. So I don't know how we would have done this without the internet and technology. The, the sharing of information is so rich. Uh, this is a, a, a World Economic Forum page that I think of a lot when it comes to, to thinking about the different global issues, not, not just, you know, everything is connected, but not, but this is not exclusive to the climate, um, food security. Some of these things came up uh, during our discussions. Uh, yeah, and I think, I think the, the whole concept of resilience hubs, you know, has, has um, potential for other parts uh, of the world. So, yeah, you know, a lot of good work here. Yeah, everything is, I mean, everything is literally connected yeah and and you know the interesting thing about the work i do and pg e does is that energy is one of those things that absolutely connects to every everything else uh, I mean, that's for sure so i put i put a link to the uh to that last website into the chat and then this if you're really interested in exploring the dynamics of uh and i i i want to say that kind of the, the interplay between these things, because 
one of the things I like about the World Economic Forum site is, I'm not sure where to find it, and you might be able to help me with that, uh, Paul. There's yeah. a there's a there's there's a page they have where it's all these connections. It's a graphic, and then you click mm -hmm. on one, and it expands. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it's it's been a oh here it is lost. there it is yeah you got it yeah yeah I don't know if they changed it to a member only kind of a thing or not let's see right had it where'd it go so it's, a, it's another reference point there's some really good information and case studies behind each of those icons and and stuff like that so it's it's a source of a good um, you know yeah. research or what have you I guess I, I guess it works if I open up a topic here so food security uh climate change and food security and then it tells you you know what are the what are the what are the kind of the secondary related features or sub features connected to that topic Thanks. food security at the at the middle and then climate change and they talk about risks and resilience the ocean values future of the environment uh different goals for uh for goals water of course is in there and if you click on water i think it puts water in the middle. See that? And you can say water infrastructure. And it tells you all the little little touch points to that subtopic with water right at the middle. So I love this tool for researching. Uh, all know. right, I, I'm going to have to jump off the, the meeting, but I want to, again, congratulate the whole uh, Thank the whole you, teams. Paul. It was great. Really. Thank you for helping our, our this, this uh, cohort of teams out. And thank you for joining us for our uh, our final presentation. We're going to be having a graduation next week. You'll be included in the inv invitation. Where fantastic! That's been a pleasure, and thanks to everyone. Outstanding performance. Really appreciate it. And good thanks, luck Paul. with everything. All right. Bye, everyone. I'm going to ask Alicia how it's going over there. Oh wait, we are wrapping up. She just wrote three minutes ago. Oh boy. I tell you. Everybody did so well. See, and then I just got invitations to connect on LinkedIn. I've got uh, one of you. Thank you. And then uh, Avinash B is somebody at PG&E. And let's see, Jocelyn Friedel, what's her, what's her thing? Uh, but Avinash is data engineer at Pacific Gas and Electric Company. Just asked to connect to me. I like that. There's another mentor. There's another personal mentor right there. Data engineer skills. Huh. Definitely a data engineer skills. Snow SQL, Toad 12.9, SharePoint, Control M, Apache Spark, Apache Spark ML, Snowflake Python SQL. <laughs> That's a data person. All right, Alicia Burt, she says she's ready with the results. Oh my God. Okay, I'm gonna close all the rooms, breakout rooms, breakout rooms. Uh, you all can just leave your room. Uh, we apologize. We didn't know how to transport back. I'm. <laughs> you got it. I just uh, texted. Uh, I just texted Alicia. I didn't want to close the rooms in case you were. I always get vertigo, dizzy. You know, spinning through. <laughs> Coming back. That's tough. That's that. That time travel is hard. Exactly. Another dimension. <laughs> okay. I, I want to ask our students open your cameras if you can. I know you have. I know we have a couple, but you'll remember you were chosen initially because you all had your cameras on. So we love that. Thank you. Cameras on. Good job. Oh man, I know it's another long day. Well, this was really hard for us, by the way. Yeah. yeah. They, they didn't make it easy. So 
um, with that, I, I'm going to actually um, ask Chris to just again, Chris, would you like to thank our students as the Director of Sustainability and, and share, express your um, gratitude for their thoughts and the, the future that they bring to sustainability? Uh, I would be honored to do that, Felicia. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, I, all of you, I think you just kind of take a little bow, drop the mic, whatever it is. Uh, excellent, excellent work. I've had the opportunity to do a few of these uh, with Barry. And uh, I agree with what you guys said earlier. You know, th this was an outstanding, outstanding set of proposals. Very, very practical, very real, felt very real. And um, the way that you all, uh, you know, kind of supported each other and, and prepared for this, the poise, it's, it's a little intimidating, right? To be answering questions. You don't know what we're gonna ask. Um, and you all answered with, with poise. You answered in a way that showed that you had done some research, you'd done some homework and put some thought into this. But the other thing I, I loved about it was as part of our questions, you know, we were also kind of throwing you some ideas and you're very open to those ideas, you know, like, oh yeah, you know, we thought about that, but that, that could be kind of, that could work. And, and that just shows a real um, curiosity you know, it's one of our virtues at PG&E is being curious and, um, and empathetic, you know, to the communities that you're trying to, to serve. And um, so I, uh, I really applaud you. Hopefully you learned something, you know, through this process. I will just tell you as somebody who has been personally working uh, to address climate change for many, many years, it's an emergency. Uh, you know, the, um, the climate scientists worldwide have come together and uh, you know, called it a, um, uh, you know, like a, a last cry, you know, for humanity to come together and help address this because um, climate change is happening. It's real. And while we still have time to decarbonize and reduce emissions, we are also adapting to changing climate. You just see that, you know, with extreme weather. And for those of us who have a few more years under the belt, you know, we remember a time when the weather wasn't so extreme you know, and uh, you can kind of compare it to what we're seeing. And so there's a, there's a real moral responsibility I think all of us have to not only address the climate crisis, but support communities, particularly those who have less ability to, uh, to adapt. And you see it all the time that the climate impacts are gonna affect the most vulnerable. And so these are our, you know, neighbors and family members and communities uh, just drive around California and you'll, you'll see it. And so I just want to applaud you for taking the time to do this. Hopefully you learn something for it and wherever you end up studying or doing in your career, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you can't go wrong by serving others. It, it's really, I think what we're all called to do, whether that's our actual jobs or our volunteer work, it's one of the most fulfilling things uh, that you can have and uh, and serving our planet. So uh, hats off to you and um, and stay connected, you know, to PG&E. This is a wonderful opportunity that you have. We're a big company. We hire. Uh, we're looking for bright minds to come and help address these issues, these challenges. So uh, I would just encourage you to stay connected with, with PG&E as, uh, as your career uh, and, and life unfolds. Thank you so much, Chris, yeah. and um, for for this team. Again, you're you're hearing from a, a leader in in the state of California at, who is a leader in the nation. So thank you, Chris, for joining us. Yeah. So with that, I am um, I will announce our first and second place teams. But um, again, with the caveat that you all astounded me, the judges. We I had to finally tell them we got to come to a decision here, folks. So, so here we go. The second place team, I'll start with them. The second place team is team number five. Yay! <laughs> La Sierra Hills, Turp and Tank, Turp and Tank, great job. And our first place winners is our team number one, the partnership with CSU Chico. Wow. Let's hear it for the few fire prevention. Thank you teams. And wow. everyone, you did an excellent job.
I'm I'm proud of the work that you did and and thank you mentors and Barry for providing support. Uh, Alicia, th thank you judges and thank you Alicia and and uh, Regina and, and Chris uh, uh, definitely. But all of these all of these teams are amazing and all of them won. All of them won. They definitely did. And and every team member is getting a twenty five dollar gift card. Just a little bonus. Nice. What? Yeah, just a little. Wow. Bonus. Second place is getting a little bump. Each member getting a fifty dollar gift card. A little bump. And then the first place team uh, another bump. They get a hundred dollar wow. gift card. Nice. Yeah. Wow. Nice That's, work, guys. That's sweet. Yeah. And the important thing is that everybody knows they're winners. Everybody gets that gift card. Do something fabulous with it. Uh, treat yourself to something nice because that's on top of your fifteen hundred dollar uh, stipend. You all did remarkable work. You did, and uh, and and just uh, thank you so much. It's the it's the culmination of these five weeks. Uh, and you all worked so hard and I gave you so many different little tasks to do different projects. This wasn't your first project. <laughs> I gave you projects all day long and you had so many speakers. I think the the, the most important thing I, I can do though is to thank pg &E for making this opportunity, creating the space uh, for us to bring volunteers and experts in the in the uh, the volunteers in the in the uh, in the company and and experts in their own right no matter what their contribution is to the country or to the company, whether it's the a gas gas leak detection or sustainability leadership or um, uh, you know their their expertise in instrumentation and and or a senior wild aquatic wildlife biologist and you know we had at least two of our speakers who I recall uh, presented at the end of the day and they said they had a really tough work day. But this was the best part of their day presenting to you guys so huge thanks to those volunteers and to those employees who came in and to our employees who are here today ken and uh, tom and chris and alicia and regina and and everybody who couldn't make this uh this particular day uh, huge thanks my gosh so everybody have a great evening enjoy your wins all of you Think about, I may have to, I may need to ask everyone tomorrow what you're going to spend your 25, 50, or $100 on. So be oh. I know. Another assignment, God. Yeah. Barry just won't leave us alone. Um, so with that, thanks, everyone. I think we can call this a night and a big celebration. And remember, we're graduating next week. we got to pick the date. got to pick the time. Alicia, let's try to work that out so I can get an invitation out uh, uh, tomorrow to our mentors and our there parents and our students. And we will meet again at 1, uh, 1 p.m. interns. And uh, wow. Good yes, job. big hand. I will see you at graduation. Congratulations, right. everyone. Great job. Right. Congratulations. Great job, Tom, everybody. Tom's giving us this. All right. Come on, Tom. <laughs> you better. Have a good evening, it. everyone. I love it. All right. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Take Stay care. safe. See ya. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye, Barry. Nice job, guys. Thanks. Sweet. All right. Thanks, Seth, Jacob, Isaiah. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. Good stuff. This is the best. Thank you, Isaiah.